Dear friends, uh, we are honored today to host Bara Deib, a young Arab professional from Jerusalem in Israel. Bara is an Israeli citizen of Palestinian nationality and of Arabic ethnic roots and upbringing. Bara is also a Christian who is married to a Muslim gentleman, and both of them, they have two lovely children. Bara is also a film production professional with history of working for both for Israeli and Palestinian movie productions. She is also a teacher of the Hebrew language and has been involved for a number of years in reconciliation initiatives, working in the fields of bringing the Jews and Arabs together and helping them to learn to live together and to appreciate each other. I'm Tihomir Kukula, producer and presenter of this program, and this is a moment when I would like to welcome Bara into our program. Bara, I am looking forward to our conversation today. As we were working, preparing, planning this interview, you warned me that this was going to be a different kind of interview. But this is going to be your personal story, presenting your personal journey, your feelings, your hurts, your dreams, your desires. We are not having too many of those kind of conversations around. But I have to provide a little current introduction to our conversation and say that a brutal Hamas attack carried out on October the 7th last year on unsuspecting people in Israel who live close to Gaza, followed almost immediately by the relentless retaliatory attacks that have been carried out since October the 7th on the Palestinian and against Palestinian and Arab people across Gaza and the West Bank by the Israeli forces on a daily basis have practically changed everything for everyone living in Palestine, the West Bank, and in Israel. And I have to say, this conflict, due to its extreme character, has also changed many things for all of us who live in different parts of the world. The whole world has been affected, and healing of relationships is urgently needed. But the amount and intensity of hurts imposed on people will make it eventually into a long, challenging, enduring, and painful process. And this is why we need to have these kind of conversations. This is almost six months since everything has changed for everyone. And what we really want to know today how has all of it impacted you at this time, your family, your friends, your relationships, and especially the inner harmony or this inner conviction that you belong to all, to Arabs, to Palestinians, and to the Jewish people? How do you manage to sustain yourself in a hostile environment that I assume does not welcome people such as yourself. But before we wander deeper into those questions in this conversation, I would like you to take a few words and introduce yourselves further. Tell us more about yourself, more than what I have actually shared a moment ago. And then try to remember the days before October the 7th, last year. How did this blend or harmony of multiple identities work for you in the days before October the 7th, last year? Welcome, Bara. So, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Bara'a. I am from Nazareth. Uh, originally, I was born there. I was raised there. I come from Christian family not converted. I became also a believer uh, by the age of nine. 
in, uh, I was raised in Christian school. And a few years later, also my parents became believers and I was raised in Christian home too. I grew up and I moved to Tel Aviv to study and work. I lived in Tel Aviv 12 years. And on my first year in Tel Aviv, I met uh, the love of my life. Uh, he happens to be a uh, Muslim. Uh, it was very hard for me to to decide to marry uh, to marry him. It took a few years, but uh, I did in 2018. I used to work on cinema industry uh, in Israeli and Palestinian movies. And then I moved to Jerusalem uh, after my marriage. I live in Jerusalem for six years now. I have two kids. I taught Hebrew in Jerusalem for Arab students from East Jerusalem. Yes, I, I do have many identities. <laughs> it's very hard to have so much identities in one person, but I am Palestinian. I was raised in Palestinian family, which were in Nazareth before the 48. And as a person who was born in Israel, I got Israeli citizen. Uh, so I am part of this country. I speak Arabic as my mother tongue language, but I'm very uh, I, I speak Hebrew very well too, and English, of course, even though it's the least uh, language I'm good at. And to be honest, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but I think I always had the ability to understand and live each group, you know, and especially after my marriage, I got another identity which is the Muslim uh, identity. And I, I became also part of me as a Muslim. So I I understand the mentality. I understand the culture. So I have all in one, you know. Before the 7th of October, it was, you know, never was easy. But I, I felt like it's a gift to be in that position. Uh, and after the 7th of October, I think, I'm dealing with serious questions and many, many hard <laughs> times answering part of my identities. I can hear my Israeli friends, my Jewish Israeli friends, and I hear my people, I hear Palestinians. And uh, to be in that position, it's uh, not easy for me those days. But uh... Let us for a moment still stay within this period before the October the 7th. I'm really intrigued with this identity blend being Israeli and Arab at the same time. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an illustration or two? What did it actually look like to be Arab Israeli before October the 7th? I think I was raised on the years that everything has ch changed, maybe, because I wasn't, I didn't live the same uh, situation like my grandparents and not like my parents. I lived, uh, like, my youth were on the 2000. Since the year 2000, we can say, Israel has changed its approach to Palestinians inside Israel. And I felt that change, you know. I think the previous years were better for Arab Israelis or for Palestinians living in Israel in many ways, also financially, but they have changed the way they deal with us. Like, like I can feel the change from the year I went to university, which was 2008, let's say, 2007. Uh, and I lived in Tel Aviv. And each year it became slightly different. And, sl you know, it never was perfect or easy. But, of course, it was easier before. Before, let's say, even 2014. And I think I have one thing that... 
not helped me, but made me blend in in many, many groups. The people don't recognize that I'm Arab by my look. And the fact that I'm not wearing hijab, of course, it makes it different, you know. People wouldn't say that I am an Arab and they would approach me as a, as if I was a Jew. <laughs> and that helped me a lot in, in my years in, in Tel Aviv and now in Jerusalem, actually. Also, that made me face many racist <laughs> comments as well. But it's the gift of not being recognized as an enemy from the first sight. But I managed to make many friendships during the years I lived in Tel Aviv, uh, with, mainly with my Jewish co-workers, people I worked with, uh, colleagues. I made very deep friendships and I got to know many, many people. And Part of it was because I'm Arab. They needed help with Arabic or anything that, you know, especially in the film industry. This is how I start working there too, because I'm Arab. And I can say that it it's very easy to understand the Israeli mentality. It's very easy to speak with Israelis. Uh, and in that sense, I was raised not in my home, but in general, my generation, we get the Israeli mindset. We speak the language, we work, and we could live in Jewish cities like Tel Aviv. I get really close to them. I, you know, I had neighbors. I, I was very much involved, which, for example, didn't happen to my parents in that way. You know, my parents lived in Nazareth and worked in Nazareth, and it's 100% Arab population. Of course, they deal with Jewish people and they speak Hebrew very well as well. They are part of the country, but they don't have as many friends as me, for example. And this has changed like you know I, I remember in 2014 when th there was also war on Gaza and I felt the change I felt how people are becoming more and more extreme you know I, I, I remember me saying at that year that I'm not afraid of the missiles uh, coming from Gaza I'm afraid to go out to 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 the stairs to, you know, to be in safer place in the building. I couldn't do that. I wouldn't go out because the comments you would hear from your neighbors would shock me. I, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that, you know? And each year since then also, it, it goes by politics too. Things have become more and more extreme and people became, more and more disconnected, you know, and my friend <laughs> on Facebook became less and less each year, you know. Um, and don't get me wrong, I still have so many friends, like very good friends that I love and I talk with them all the time. It didn't disappear. But it's very hard to be, to know what is the Israeli mainstream is, is, is saying or thinking, you know? Um, news, for example. I used to watch Israeli news all the time. I was involved. I, I wanted to know. Now I cannot watch TV. I just read newspapers. I cannot, I cannot watch it. I cannot hear it, you know? We live here there is this connection between us. And part of it is how they teach Arabic, for example. You know, if you want, if you're a Jew and you want to teach, to learn Arabic, it's uh, especially in high school, it's for military reasons, let's say. So in that way, it doesn't help. There's no many ways to connect with the other side if you want to. And also in 2018, there was this law that uh, uh, in Israeli parliament uh, that was passed uh, 
that basically it says that Arabs are not as equal as Jewish. And this is another turning point where you understand that you can think that you are equal, but you are not. This is your land, but this is not your country. You know what I mean? You can claim to say that I'm from Nazareth and my all my grandparents are from there, but it's not the country, it's not the government who doesn't see it like that. And it changed it all, you know, it changed your way of thinking and acting and working. But yeah, I think we are the minority who can get Israelis and yet we are still we're still Palestinians, so we, we face it from all sides. The situation before October the 7th and the relationships, although not ideal, and your status also in Israel, although not ideal, was somehow, can I say, manageable? But I would like to ask you a question now. What has changed? What has happened? We know, all of us, what happened on October the 7th. And after that, but I'm coming from the perspective of those relationships of you with those multiple identities living in Israel, relationships with other people. What has changed? What does it look like for a person like yourself to be in Israel right now, after October the 7th? Everything has changed on my own personal life and in general, in the, in the city where I live, in Jerusalem, um, I can say that I can mark the 7th of October as a day that changed me and my perspective on life also. I think the first week I was in total shock. It took some time to understand how big it is and how massive it's going to be because I heard the shock and grief of Israelis. And I knew that they wanted revenge and that the attack would be very, very brutal. And, you know, since then, the news, especially on social media, they are part of my daily life. It's uh, in the morning, you see horrible videos and images and in the evening and before you go to sleep and in the morning and another big thing is happening and this hospital or that, you know, my Facebook turned to be a graveyard since the 7th of October, honestly. And the amount of people dying since that day is, is something that we cannot really handle. You, you cannot imagine what is 30,000 people um, to be killed. My love to my children has changed, you know. Uh, the way I take care of them has changed. Um, of course, there is so much fear since the 7th of October. And part of it, it's because extremists, they can say more. They can talk more. There's no uh, limit, you know, to what you can say or what you cannot say. Everything is okay to say. You can express yourself the way you want. I'm talking about Israelis, of course, because for us, it's the total opposite. You know, you can hear horrible things, but you cannot answer them. them, Or you cannot say uh, even the simplest things. You cannot show your sorrow for what's going on in Gaza. And actually, many people have lost their jobs because of that. If you're angry or if you're sad this is not okay to feel i'm talking about of course palestinians living in israel and my this is my own reality you know i in that way i'm not as other people living in the west bank because their life has been extremely more changed than mine but i i witness what's going on in israel and yet I am considered to be the inside enemy uh, since the 7th of October. You can see more guns on the street. 
people are being much more aggressive. And that is something that even if it was all the time here and there, since the 7th of October, it became so extreme that you cannot run away of it. You, there's no, you cannot just go into a coffee shop and sit and have a nice conversation, you know. It's everything is so different. I cannot speak Arabic in public places anymore. Or if I do, I have to be very careful because everybody's giving me looks and everybody's so careful. Yeah, not mine alone. Everybody's life has changed. I think also for some Israelis, but not all of them. There is still a feeling that life must keep going. And in Israel, there is that privilege. In the West Bank, it's so different. In Gaza, of course, you you don't need me to tell you what's going on in there. It's uh, Things are extremely changed. And since we witnessed that, I cannot say that I can keep living my life normally. I have this grief every day. The news I hear, the reality we face, it affects every minute in your life. It, it affects you so deeply that you cannot keep going as, as before. And of course, the trauma, the collective trauma that we are also living. So, of course, my life has changed dramatically <laughs> since the 7th of October. Thank you, Bara. I would like to keep you still for a moment focused on that fatal day of October the 7th last year. Uh, could you give us a personal touch? share a personal story or a personal moment or a personal reflection that will help us experience a little bit deeper how dramatic, how traumatic, how changing and altering this day was for you and people you know. On the 7th of October, I woke up very early, 6.30, because I needed to go to Jerusalem. I wasn't in Jerusalem. I had work day. And I went out from a city, which is like, I think, one hour, one hour far from Jerusalem. And I opened the radio on my car and I heard that there is missiles going, like, you know, going to heading to Tel Aviv and all the south part of the country. And I was like, okay, what, 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 what's going on now? Like, wh why is that? Usually it, it's, there's a reason, you know, something had happened. So this is the reaction. And I couldn't think of anything happening. I, I arrived to Jerusalem. I stopped in my house. When I was in Jerusalem, I heard the sirens. And I was like, this is very strange because if they are, Sending rockets to Jerusalem, this is very, very serious. This usually doesn't happen. And I, I got really panicked, really panicked, mostly because I'm away from my children. So I felt like I need to go to them right now. So I, I went into my car and I started driving like crazy. The streets, it's Saturday morning. So, you know, that the country is shot mostly, you know, people not in the streets, it's not working day. And I found out that some roads are closed and I got even more panicked. And all the way back to my in-laws, I heard the sirens all the way and I was really terrified, really terrified. I felt like I just, I want to get to them and hug them and I don't want anything else, you know. It was a huge shock for us all. And I think by 12 noon, I could understand the, how massive and how big it is. And it was horrible attacks. Many innocent people have died, killed in very awful way. I was in real shock. I couldn't say my mind. 
the only thing I did was talking to my Jewish friends, especially from the South, asking if they are okay, and sending to many others um, short messages where I'm saying, I love you, it's hard for me too, I understand, you know. I could see my kids on the on the Israeli side, you know. I, I felt like I am going through the trauma as an Israeli, not as a Palestinian. And I have to mention also that many Arabs were victims of, of the 7th of October too. Uh, workers, Bedouins, um, even they were kidnapped. So I felt like an Israeli. I think for the first time of my life, I didn't want this to happen under my name as a Palestinian. And that made me think a lot uh, about what's going on. And that also gave the majority of Israelis to act and speak their mind with no filters. And I, I, it took me also a while to understand that I became also suspicious for them. No matter who I am, what I feel, what I think, the fact that I'm Palestinian, uh, Arab, living in Israel, I am the enemy now. And I don't even have the possibility to to take other position, you know. Shortly, they start bombing in Gaza. And, you know, also as a Palestinian, I wouldn't, you know, I felt... I knew that it's it's going to be hard and you know horrific, but I couldn't speak my mind. I couldn't say I'm against those attacks too. Since the October seventh, we know that everybody's watching and listening to whatever you post or say. Now we have to be very careful of how we express ourselves. But I'm listening to you, and to me it seems that so much has changed. And I'm talking relationally now, since October the 7th, comparing with the time before October the 7th, although it was not ideal either, but it's different now. You mentioned that you had many friends, and you still on your part are having friends who are... Jewish people, how have those relationships changed since then, since October the 7th last year? You know, it's not like Arabs and Jewish were really living together all the time. In some places, of course, yes. But in many ways, after the 7th of October, there has been people are scary from each other. I'm, 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 and I'm talking about Jewish being scared from Arabs and Arabs being scared from Jewish people. Also, we had two years ago, we had very, um, you know, on May 20, 2021, there was an, all kind of events that put those relationship on a test, you know. Um, but after the 7th, I think it's, it, we are being in very clear sides, okay? So you live here, you stay here, and if you live there, you stay there. People are asking me, for example, if they can come to my house, if it's safe to come to my house, if it's safe for me and for them. And I have to be honest, I'm scared to take my kids with me to Jewish places many times. I'm scared if they speak in Arabic, because people look, you know, if you speak in Arabic now, people are, they give you the look of, oh my God, <laughs> you know. Um, also the relationship between uh, Jewish people and the language, you know. Arabic became not offensive, but terrifying language to Israelis. So many of them don't want to hear Arabic around them. 
but I can say also that I see people who want to interact more. I'm not sure about the numbers. I don't think that there is many people of them. Before the 7th of October, the word peace and solution weren't mentioned for 20 years. After the 7th of October, people are mentioning those words. They are trying to ask themselves, so what's next, you know? How we can keep living in this place as a Jew and as an Arab? We need the solution, you know? And therefore, many people that you wouldn't think they would ask themselves that questions, they are dealing with that. And to be able to answer them, they need to communicate and talk. So I see also that is happening, maybe in small numbers, maybe under the ground, not publicly, not very loud, but it is also happening. And, you know, people are working together. Like if we talk about hospitals mm -hmm. um, and other places, but especially hospitals, you know, people are being together in the hospitals. Most of the, not most, but many of the staff in the hospital, uh, physicians, doctors, uh, nurses, they are Arabs. And they are treating Jewish population and Arab population, of course, but they're treating everyone. And that brings conversation. Sometimes it's very short, professional conversations. And many times it goes to the personal side. So in a way, people are being away from each other more than before. But I think for many people, not the majority, they have the urge to to communicate and listen and able to understand. But it feels that because the war is still going, it's hard to be like, it's not post-war talks. We're still having things happening and we are still dealing with it. So it's, it's very sensitive. People are being very careful, but mostly also scared. Yeah, unfortunately. I don't trust anyone. Um, I cannot see what will happen next. Yeah, we are all super careful now. And I'm talking about Israelis in Israel, whether they are Arabs or Jewish, you know? It, it's very different from talking about the West Bank because it's a different story. West bankers are not allowed to go in Israel into Israel since the 7th of October. It's a very different story. I wanted to ask you a question even before, but this is maybe a proper time for that question, just for you to continue this conversation that you started with your last statement. And this is that there is this fear on both sides. What would you say if you would assess the people, Arabs on our side, Palestinians, and on the other side, the Jewish people, what are they like? In what way they are different? In what way they are similar? And, and maybe, uh, what do you see to be the longings of each of those groups of people? First of all, I would like to mention, again, that this is my own point of view. This is my perspective. And I definitely don't, do not represent the majority of people. What I live and what I see is so different than other Palestinian, especially if they live in the West Bank uh, or in Gaza, of course, and even in Jerusalem. My life is my journey and my status is, is a bit different than people living in Jerusalem, for example. And that gave me the ability to uh, to meet and talk with Israelis, and I could get a different perspective about the, this uh, reality. I think I can see 
the similarity between Israelis and Palestinians and the collective trauma. Of course, it's different traumas, but they're both going through trauma. Both nations are living in fear. I believe that Israelis, they have very deep fear and Palestinians are living the fear. They are trying to survive this time, no matter where they are, whether in in Gaza, in the West Bank, and also Palestinians living in Israel. The differences come from different daily life, different routine. Palestinians live under control. You know, they they do not they cannot manage their own life. Everything in the in the end goes to Israel and their policy, their politics, and he and how they want to uh, move things. So if you live in the West Bank, you 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 are dealing with settler settlers, and it's very difficult reality they don't have any protection and since the 7th of october actually over 400 uh, palestinians in the west bank were killed and many have been displaced as well so the daily life is so different i think an israeli could keep his life going in a way or other of course, we have the people, uh, the families of the hostages. They are not uh, living their life as before, of course. And some people inside Israel have changed their, their uh, where they live because of the war. That's too. Some other lost their, uh, their dear ones. In general, the the daily life is keep going in Israel. In Palestine, this is not really happening. And that brings all the other differences between them. If we want to mention solution for each of these groups, it's very different solution that they can bring up. Uh, it's like the, the word peace for each group is so different. It means different things. For Palestinians, peace means justice and giving back, uh, giving them back their rights and uh, ability to go back to their homes. And for Jewish people, peace means security. And if they could get secu security and uh, if they are safe, then this is peaceful enough for them. On the 7th of October, this has changed. And we we understand that neither of these groups got any kind of peace. I think both of both those groups don't see each other living together anymore. But this is actually very problematic because there's too many millions living on this land and a solution must be found. We must find a way to meet and live because if not, this war can go on and on for many, many years. I think children means a lot to both groups. Each group doesn't want to lose their children. And each group wants to live. What I want to really say in answering this question, that in the end, we are very similar. We are human. We want to live our life. We want to enjoy our life. We want to see our kids grow in a place where they can be anything they want, live their life, happy life. And if we can focus on that, maybe after some time and long process of healing, we can see the similarities 
and we can achieve that. For now, even though we are all grieving, our daily lives is very changed, is very different. And the last thing maybe I can add is we, we love this land and we want to be here for a reason. And I think this land can can have us all. I truly believe in this. A hundred years of war have brought us to here. And we need to end this in a way that we we can still, all of us, enjoy where we are with no more killing, no more sorrow. It's enough, really. It's enough. We have known each other through the working of the Initiative of Rome, which stands for the Renewing Our Minds, initiative that was established in the Balkans, in Croatia, to serve internationally the entire Balkans, but also and more than the Balkans. And this initiative was built uh, soon after the wars in the former Yugoslavia between Serbs, Croats, and Bosniaks in the 90s, with the reason and desire to bring young people from that region who have been basically hurt by this conflict and the divisions that have been created to bring them together to learn to accept each other to look at each other with empathy not necessarily to justify this or that but try to build a new generation of young people in that region a new kind of relationships and my question to you is this Looking from the perspective of what is happening right now in your country, in your region, when you look at back at this experience and maybe some others, because I'm sure that you have attended other kind of gatherings and conferences and seminars, do you think that those kind of events, and especially as you know, minds, have in any way helped you to prepare you a little bit for what you are experiencing right now? When you look at those things now from the perspective of what you're experiencing right now. Um, so I, I I went to Rome first time, I think it was 2007. I was 19 years old, but for many years I, I, I did meet with uh, Jewish people on those kind of events, you know, bringing Jewish and Arabs together. But when I went to, uh, to Rome, I was outsider to another conflict or, you know, different history. Um, the um, biggest thing for me was that for you, it was history. You were after that war and I was still living it kind of, you know. But as outsider, I could understand how it works, you know, because for me, Croats, Serbs, Bosnia... Well, very similar, you know. Of course, each group has its own narrative and story, you know, but I was an outsider. I couldn't see really the differences. I had to be taught what's different, you know. But what really was interesting to me is that that word didn't mean to me anything, but it was the whole world. People were very, were coming to Rome with with something to say and emotions and history and sorrow and grief and pain and to be able to reconnect them all we had to learn about empathy and forgiveness and you know many basic things to be able to connect with the other with the other side with the enemy in many ways and that affected me on how I see my own reality. You know, I know that I have a specific narrative that I can tell you about my story. But if you interview now Israeli person, he will tell you very different things, you know. And what really means to me doesn't mean that it means to him. And to this, that 
we have social media going on and what I see is definitely what the Israeli this is not what he's say seeing so we also we we don't read the same newspaper we don't watch the same videos we have different uh, you know I specifically yes I do watch everything because I speak all languages so I uh, like Hebrew and Arabic so I I see everything going around me. I see what's really important for each side, you know, and how they are living it, how they are thinking about it. Again, I don't justify many things that I hear and I I know that are being said or, you know, delivered. But I understand each group and how it's developing. And I think that gave me a possibility to connect to many uh, my of my Jewish friends and to be able to to communicate, but really communicate, not just having good conversation, but really talking to them. And that gave me a shortcut, you know, to even to deal with my feelings. And my um, my thoughts, and uh, from the fears that you know, things that I fear, you know, and most of all, the understanding of the need to come together and talk together, and I think this didn't happen really in Israel before people, Israelis and Arabs, never had deep relationships. Of course, there is stories here and there, examples here and there, but not as a collective, you know. And I now understand how we need this um, to communicate. But I am glad that you found your experiences with the Renewing Our Minds initiative, as we call it for short, Rome, to be a blessing to you and to be helpful to you, even, even contributing to your work in reconciliation in your homeland. And now moving to something else, which I, just by association, you mentioned how important communication is. And when I'm thinking of communication, I'm thinking about how at this moment it seems that the whole world is communicating in a very highly opinionated way about the conflict in your homeland. But I'm not sure always that uh, our opinions and our judgments, what ought to be done or what not ought to be done, is really helping much people in Gaza, people in Israel, people in the West Bank. When you are looking at the way the world is responding to the conflict in your home, in your homeland, what kind of thoughts do you have? This war, I think because of how big it is and massive, it's, uh, it's a genocide and people are reacting, of course. The world has a lot to do with our cause. A lot the world has part of this world war you know um everybody has something to say about it because first of all it's it's in every house almost you can see it uh we are living in in the media age and Everybody, everybody can hold the camera and uh, show you what's going on. So we can see it. It's not like other wars before that you cannot, you couldn't imagine what's going on. Everything is on a video and in your, in your phone. And I think there is two, two sides. Everybody's taking a side, you know. Justice is something that you need to to shout very loud and say you want to call for justice. You want to say out loud that this is wrong or this is okay. 
but what I I think we really need is a bridge. It's is help to to find a way out of this war. There's a saying that I love that says, "Don't curse the darkness, but be candle." And I I I believe in this sentence. Of course that. Israel Palestine has always been an issue and in the last year it it seems that it has changed in the public opinion but we who live here uh we understand that we don't need more power or guns or weapons we need a bridge we need a third side that says we want to help to rebuild this damage and not to make it even worse. You know, I truly believe that only true peace and true justice can bring, bring brighter future to us here. And it makes me sad sometimes when I hear uh, the aggressive uh, comments sometimes when it when it comes from foreigners and people living outside, um, I understand the passion. I understand the the grief and the shock of what's going on, and people want to to take part of it. But it's very important to to build and not bring more damage. This is what I, I think is, is the best way to put it. Be part of it in order to bring something, to bring light and not more darkness. But I have one more question for you and it has to do with the future. We don't know it, but we do have our hopes and we, our dreams. So I would like to ask you a question. What are you, when you are thinking about this complexity complexity of the situation and circumstances present in your region there, and it doesn't look optimistic at this moment, but nevertheless, what are your dreams and hopes about the future of your country where such a diversity of people, ethnic and religious, lives together but somehow not together still my dream is to be able to raise my kids in a place where many different people are living all together you know i live in jerusalem believe me this is the place you know jerusalem is made many people in jerusalem are so different from each other we are not in the perfect place yet. We are very far away from that place even. But I really dream that a new generation will grow here knowing and believing that we can uh, live together based on justice and peace, real justice and real peace. I really hope and dream that we will become united financially, for example. I, I truly believe that Arabs and Jews can make a fortune out of, of the Holy Land. You know, we can make, be successful in anything. You know, we actually work good together. We can be good partners. I really dream that people can get anywhere they want without any borderlines and without any soldiers on the street. I really dream that I can, or my son can get to any position without being asked what religion you are or how do you define yourself. I really hope that we can get to the point where we appreciate the land we live on, but not more than the other side. 
I really appreciate the land I live in, but it's not more worthy than anybody's life. You know, this land have seen lots of blood for over one hundred years, and even before I I believe. But on our recent uh, history, for one hundred years, wars have been happening on this land. And I really hope that we can just live here peacefully without thinking about am I being going to be killed soon or not. I really hope that Palestinians will get recognized as people who has right to live here also. I really dream that we could forgive each other, even though it sounds the the hardest thing of all lots of pain and sorrow is going on it seems very very far away but i really i really hope for that that one day we could say yeah we did hor- horrible things but we are going to fix that i dream that we don't need to think about what position you want to be as a soldier in the future. And we put aside all this military talk and we see each other as people, as a human. And we can connect um, and relate on that basis, you know. It's very simple yet very complicated dreams to get, I guess. The most important thing I as a mother, and that changed me a lot before and after being a mother. I think about my kids and I really want them a decent future where they are safe, where they where they can get anything they want or any position they want and they can be whatever they want. And I'm really scared of the idea that they will grow up in a place where, where they think Oh, I am Arab, so I'm I'm less because I'm Arab, not a Jew. I don't want that for them, not at all. Barad, thank you, thank you very much for this insightful, personal, vulnerable, truthful conversation that you have just shared with us, which is a kind of conversation that we do not hear too often nowadays, although we should be, we should be actually hearing more people like yourself who are truthful to the circumstances, truthful to the situation that surrounds you, but at the same time, at the same time, looking towards light at the end of the tunnel. So my prayer for you and his eyes is that you should continue to be strong and committed to bringing healing into the lives of people around you and to building bridges of communication and goodwill despite the prevailing divisions and hostilities at this time. May God bless you and may we speak again soon the way we did today.